What if I told you that your mood problems, your memory problems, your trouble focusing, your ADD, or in depression are not all in your head, but instead in your body? In episode two of the Broken Brain docuseries, we talk about the mind-body connection, or more specifically, the gut-brain connection. The truth is that most diseases that impact our brain don't always start in the brain. In fact, they often start in the gut. This discovery completely changes our understanding of brain health and how to treat brain disorders. But has your doctor ever told you about the gut-brain connection? I'm guessing not. How is it that we've so missed the mark when it comes to one of the most important pieces of this puzzle? You know, most of us have heard of mind-body medicine, which means the mind affects the body, that stress can impact almost any illness. And we know that and that's well accepted. But what we don't know or don't think about very often is that the body can affect the mind. Everything from depression, anxiety, ADD, dementia, all these things can be affected by what's happening in your body. And that's pretty much ignored by most psychiatry. <laughs> There's this whole field of psychiatry was very descriptive, but it's not talking about causes. So basically they think your body is disconnected from your head, except for the stress response, and that you know we shouldn't be looking for treatment for depression in your gut or treatment from autism in your immune system, right? So we have a very different way of thinking in functional medicine, which is actually looking at how the body affects the brain. We're now learning that your microbiome, this ecosystem of bugs in your gut, has been linked to depression, to ADD, to autism, even to Alzheimer's. So we always thought the gut and the brain were kind of disconnected. Maybe if you're stressed, you'll get diarrhea, but the fact that your whole gut environment is driving changes in your brain is a very new discovery. When I think of the brain, I automatically think of the microbiome. To me, and the microbiome and the brain are really part of one whole. They're really inseparable, in fact, I believe that the whole brain is not just from what we find from our neck up, but it's really also what's in our gut. I like to think of them as really one unit, as one whole. Embryologically, the, the gut and the brain, they start out at the same point. And then they, one goes up and one goes down. But when, they, when, when two cells start from the same place, they always retain a memory for each other. So the microbiome and the gut, the, the gut, the gastrointestinal system is the housing for the microbiome, the trillions of bacteria, the friendly bacteria. They have direct communication to the brain. There's a bi-directional highway. They're constantly speaking to each other in so many different ways. They're communicating messages to each other. These messages are part of a, a, com a communication system that really outshines any type of communication system that we know of today with our modern technology. It's really staggering. And this communication actually mostly originates from the microbiome up to the brain. There's 400 times the amount of messages coming from the microbiome to the brain than from the brain to the body. We now have the ability to significantly bolster and enhance and improve that flow of communication both improving the gut and the microbiome, and most important, improving the brain. Gut bacteria are really interesting because they affect much more than the gut. You know, one of the areas they affect is the brain. You know, there's this gut direct highway between the gut and the brain, it's the vagus nerve. So what's going on in the gut is gonna affect your brain. And gut bacteria are affected by so many things that we do in our lives. Even the water we drink, you know, there's, we have chlorinated water that's gonna affect our gut bacteria. The antibiotics in our food are gonna affect our gut bacteria. What we eat is gonna affect our gut bacteria. So what, how you treat your gut bacteria is going to affect not only your gut, but your brain and the rest of your body. Many of us are starting to understand the significance of the gut as it relates to our overall health, including the brain. In fact, many scientists and physicians have begun to refer to the gut as our second brain. So speaking of the brain, um, you know, we're talking about, in a sense, a bacterial brain that lives in your gut. 
but there's also kind of a second nervous system. We call it the second brain in the gut. So talk about how that influences your health and Alzheimer's and brain function and, and what people can do about it, what causes it. It doesn't really make sense anymore to uh, differentiate between the gut and the brain because they really are functionally very, very similar. I think that the, the relationship of the gut to the brain is both physical, but it's also chemical. We talk about serotonin and dopamine and so-called neurotransmitters. Failing to recognize that the lion's share of these chemicals are not made in the brain, they're made in the gut. Yeah. And they are made at levels that lead to mood stabilization when the gut is healthy. Intriguingly, we now look upon, for example, depression and inflammatory disorder as possibly having its genesis in the gut. How do we know that? Because markers of gut leakiness or permeability are dramatically elevated in correlation with depression as they are in uh, Alzheimer's disease, autism, and even Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. So again, we mentioned earlier that we've got to pull away from uh, being so cerebrocentric and look at the body as a whole and particularly uh, the gut for reasons that you well described, the number of organisms, their metabolic products, and not the least of which their genetic uh, component in terms of being hugely relevant in terms of health and, and longevity. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty stunning when you think about the way we sort of missed the boat and sort of blamed all sorts of other factors like bad parenting or emotional trauma or stress uh, or mental illness on the brain as opposed to the gut. And, you know, I'm not a researcher, although now we're doing research at Cleveland Clinic. For most of my career, I've been a practicing physician. And I just noticed this phenomena. I wasn't even trying to treat the brain and it would get better from all sorts of conditions by simply fixing the gut. I've always had anxiety and the, the anxiety always was located in my stomach. It was like a certain sensation that I would have in my stomach that I associated with different thoughts or feelings. So if I, I'm a little bit of a introvert and so if I was gonna go to a party or something, I would get this feeling in my gut that was like being nervous about going to the party. And that is something that subsequently has gone away since I've been working with the Ultra Wellness Center. I remember one day, maybe two or three weeks later, standing in my kitchen, opening the refrigerator, and all of a sudden I realized that that feeling of anxiety that I used to have, you know, a couple times a day was gone. And it was, it was miraculous, really. I'd had that feeling for my whole life. And honestly, in the three years since then, I haven't had that sensation at all. The gut-brain connection really shows us that there's an absolute connection between all the different systems in our body so that our digestive system is impacting our brain health and our brain is impacting our digestive system. And we know that, right? When we get anxious, we have digestive symptoms like maybe some people get more constipated or other people may have more, you know, rushing to the bathroom. When there are imbalances in this gut flora, people can have more anxiety. Uh, we see that often. And that when we treat that, those imbalances, uh, with, with changes in diet, with uh, good bacteria like probiotics, with uh, fiber, um, sometimes even with, with medications to lower that, those imbalances. Uh, we see improvements in, in brain health, like we see improvements in anxiety. Having a healthy gut is central to your entire health and connected to everything that happens in your body. That's why I almost always start treating patients with chronic health problems by fixing their guts first. You can begin to understand the importance of the gut health when you consider there are over a thousand species and three pounds of bacteria in your gut. There are trillions of bacteria in your gut. In fact, they contain at least a hundred times as many genes as you do. The bacterial DNA in your gut outnumbers your own DNA by a hundred times. You have about 20,000 genes, but there are two million or more bacterial genes. We've been taught by science and colleges, universities, medical schools, that bacteria are bad. They're disease-causing, they're virulent, they're pathogenic, 
there's something that we just have to obliterate and get rid of. It was the big enemy. With the discovery of the incredible, staggering uh, numbers of bacteria in, the in us, in the microbiome, there was a, the greatest turnaround in medicine, in science, in 150 years. From bacteria being disease-oriented, virulent, pathogenic, now all of a sudden, they're, they're our greatest allies. In fact, that's what the research is showing that bacteria on Earth and within us have one primary goal, to promote healing and to promote life. Outside of us, in the world at large, and within us, that's bacteria. I'm obsessed with our gut bacteria. And, and what's interesting, we have more gut bacteria in our gut than we have cells in our body. So we're actually more bacterial than human. We as a culture are obsessed with killing bacteria. We see bacteria as bad guys. Even in the holistic world or the functional medicine world, we see it as good and bad. But I see it a little bit differently. I see it as this inner ecosystem. We have an ecosystem in our gut and we have to balance it. Over the years, I have seen emotional, psychiatric, and behavioral symptoms triggered by problems in the gut. Your gut, in fact, contains more neurotransmitters than your brain. It is highly wired back to your brain and messages travel back and forth all the time. When those messages are altered for any reason, in any direction, from the brain to the gut or the gut to the brain, your health will suffer. Our bacteria in the microbiome are producing dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, and these messages are going to the brain, sending signals to the brain, and part of this incredible communication system in the brain. They're part of the conversation. And these messenger molecules are also sending messages to our stress system the what we call the hypo HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And the microbiome, the bacteria are also sending signals to the gut to the gut cells. So we're talking about an interconnection of bacteria and brain cells, and it's so complex and it's such an incredible web that it's so you really can't separate bacteria from neurons in the brain. Dopamine is the main motivation neurotransmitter. And your ability to want to do things and to be excited to do things and to, to push yourself to do things associated with dopamine. So the person who can never finish tasks or even initiate tasks, um, those are patterns of low dopamine activity. Now, if you look at all the research, one of the most profound ways to raise dopamine is physical activity. <laughs> so when people exercise, their, their brain gets flooded with dopamine. Now, you have to have the initial motivation to start, but if that pathway gets started, then you can really flood the brain with dopamine. The other main neurotransmitter is um, serotonin. And serotonin is really involved with your, in a sense, your sense of mood is strongly involved with serotonin. But people that typically have low serotonin, they just, nothing really brings them joy. So it's not that they're depressed necessarily, it's just that the things that would normally make them happy are no longer making them happy. Right? So they don't really have a favorite song anymore, or they don't have a favorite food or a favorite TV show. Everything is just there, but nothing really excites them. And then when you look at the other main neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, that's your memory neurotransmitter. So your ability to recall things in your life and to find words and to uh, remember events, uh, to have photographic memory, those are all involved with acetylcholine. And then GABA is the calming down inhibitory neurotransmitter. <laughs> So that allows you, if GABA levels are imbalanced, you may have things like anxiety um, as, a, as a key thing or restless mind. So those are the most common patterns with those four common neurotransmitters. Anxiety is an expression of stress. Anxiety is not a thing, it's a symptom. Depression is a symptom. All of these things, I, I would argue that mental illness in its largest frame could easily be viewed as, these are symptoms of something going on. This is an alert mechanism. You're, you're depressed, not for some esoteric reason. I mean, your, your, your body is telling you that there's something you need to do. You're anxious because your body, your, your body and your brain together are telling you, you need to do something. This is intolerable. And, and I make no judgment about the toleration level of somebody's anxiety. So by by altering the brain's electrical capacities, by allowing it to witness that better self-regulation place, that better stasis point, that anxiety starts to diminish. How that connects to the gut-brain is, 
when stress is reduced and all, which all of those chemicals that are being released start to abate. Those chemicals, you're anxious, what happens? Your stomach tightens up. Some people vomit. I mean, it's, there's clearly a body reaction to this that's being driven by a perception in the brain. So it's all about the perception of the brain in many ways. It's a perception of the brain as to what's, what's happening here that's out of whack. That will, pr why do people get hives? I mean, you can go down the list of body expression. You sweat, you know, um, all kinds of things can happen to you physically. So that connection is clearly there. That perception on the part of the brain to drive a response in the body is clearly obvious. 90% of your serotonin is produced in your stomach. So I'm not sure why we're injecting it into our brains. Makes much more sense to solve the stomach problem, don't you think? So that, that bi-directionality, I think, is important to know. I mean, it's a, I think it's a fundamental, it's the next step. We're, we're, we're slowly putting this together. The, the gut biome people, fixing the, uh, gut dysbiosis is vital. You cannot function if you're consuming the wrong foods, if you've got gut flora that don't make sense. Have that tested, check it out, fix that. Take your probiotics, do the, do the things that you're supposed to do to fix that. Altogether, your gut is a huge chemical factory that helps to produce vitamins, digest your food, regulates hormones, excretes toxins, produces healing compounds, and keeps your gut healthy. Intestinal health could be defined as the optimal digestion, absorption, and assimilation of food. But that is a big job, and it depends on many other factors. The bugs in your gut are like a rainforest, a diverse, an interdependent ecosystem. They must be in balance for you to be healthy. Unfortunately, many of us are living with a damaged gut microbiome. So what damages our guts? Many things. Our SAD diet, our SAD diet, that's the standard American diet. This has led to a nation that is overfed and undernourished. Most of the country is eating too much food, but not getting enough nutrients. The MAD diet is the modern American diet. You also hear it called the SAD diet, but I prefer MAD because it makes me personally mad that we got here, right? So I grew up on a farm. I was standing out back in uh, one, of our, uh, one of our big gardens with one of my buddies, and he's like, man, how is it people go hungry in this country? All this food growing? And, and it's like, it's an incredible amount of food. I left the farm on Monday. I dropped in a bunch of sunflower seeds, a bunch of squash. I came back on Thursday, Friday we eat sunflower sprouts, the squash is up. So that's not the MAD diet. The MAD diet is not food that we grow in the ground on our great small American farms and share with each other. The MAD diet is a diet that got created for efficiency and it got created on bad, bad science. And that now is 100% clear. We moved from uh, living in rural America and eating food from small farms and eating a lot of plants to eating highly processed foods that really consist of very few ingredients. They get mixed together all kinds of different ways, but you're talking about cheap vegetable oils, so soybean oil, corn oil, lots and lots of sugars, every single way you can say it, sugars from corn, <laughs> sugars from sugarcane, uh, sugars from beets, right? And then a variety of things to make that more palatable, fake colors, fake flavorings, and, and what then gets created is a diet that is missing the most important nutrients for the brain. Nutritional deficiencies such as magnesium deficiency, zinc deficiency, vitamin D deficiency can wreak havoc on our health. Nutritional deficiencies can manifest in, in a lot of ways. There's a big difference between what's in your blood and what's inside your cells. In fact, the idea of deficiency comes from blood levels. You may well have totally normal blood levels of a nutrient, but you may be intracellularly deficient. As an example, in dementia, you may have normal B12 in your blood, but when we measure methylmalonic acid or homocysteine, those may be abnormal. And that tells us that the utilization of B12 inside your cells is abnormal. So the old idea of, um, you know, are, do you have nutritional deficiency is drawing your blood and seeing if you have enough of that vitamin in your blood. But as I mentioned earlier, there are hundreds of times more nutrients inside our cells than in our blood. So we're really now becoming aware that we have to be concerned about intracellular nutrition much more than blood nutrition. If you don't have a nutrient in sufficiency inside your cells, it turns out that you can't do normal machinery. The normal machinery of the cell won't work right. So it's gonna have wide-ranging effects. 
in the most extreme cases, we know that if you have you know, protein deficiency, you can have a disease called kwashiorkor or something, or if you have insufficient vitamin uh, C, you get scurvy. But long before you get those extreme cases of nutritional deficiency, the machinery just doesn't work well. And so when your machinery doesn't work well, you get these generalized, vague symptoms. You know, you get the symptoms of the walking well. You know, I just don't feel good. I'm just tired. You know, I sleep all night. I wake up and I'm still tired. I have brain fog. I just can't think as clearly as I used to. These kinds of general symptoms are usually associated with intracellular nutritional deficiencies. Nutrition is probably the most important fundamental thing that's driving brain disorders, including sugar, which is a potent brain neurotoxin. It's addictive. In fact, it may be more addictive than cocaine, and it's deliberately pushed into our society where we're eating 152 pounds of sugar and 142 pounds of flour, which acts just like sugar in your body. And that's been linked to everything from depression to ADD to even dementia, which is now called type 3 diabetes. So we have to take this very seriously. So our high sugar, high starch diet is key. I think that sugar is talked a lot about and we eat way too much of it. I think if you can have a healthy relationship with it. I mean, there's not one health benefit to having sugar besides it tasting good, but you can still have sugar without sugar having you. And the problem in our society is that people are just craving it and eating so much of it. And a meal doesn't feel like a meal until you know there's sugar at the end of it. And when they're feeling down or tired, then they reach for that sugar. And that's just an unhealthy relationship. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the toxic effects in the brain. I think the other major area of food that can be really harmful for the brain is the processed food in general, but a lot of the processed grains, the, the sugars, the added sugars. Uh, especially sugars that have been altered from their natural state, you know, the corn syrup, so high fructose corn syrup. A lot of information now coming out on artificial sweeteners and how damaging that is to the brain. So I think that's a really big category of foods that we want to be careful with. And, and it's for a lot of reasons. I mean, you could be eating wheat bread or whole grain bread, but still once it's in that bread form, it's it's been stripped of a lot of its nutrients. So you're getting food that's missing some of its really important nutrients, its fiber, and you're also getting food that your body's going to convert a little bit quicker into sugar. And that's what we're realizing is that the more glucose or more of the rapid rise of glucose in your blood, and therefore also insulin, it has very damaging effects on the brain. What are people now doing? They're getting the low sugar message and they're drinking and eating artificially sweetened foods. Mm. Well, that is about the worst thing you could do. For Artific your gut microbiome. For your gut microbiome. We didn't understand why artificially sweetened beverages were so associated with diabetes, for example more so than drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. Mm. People who drink artificially sweetened, no calorie, no sugar, and yet they're more than doubling their risk for diabetes. How in the world could that be? It was mm. counterintuitive. We came up with all kinds of ideas, but now Israeli researchers have shown us it is straightforward because of changes in the gut bacteria. Last month, a study came out showing a dramatic increased risk over 44% increased risk of, of getting Alzheimer's disease, becoming demented in people drinking soda. And again, what could be the mechanism? And the authors hit it on the head. It's because of changes in the gut bacteria, which then code for increasing uh, inflammation, the cornerstone of every brain disease that you don't want to mm -hmm. get. Dr. Hyman says the phrase, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal here because I love it so much that sugar is our number one recreational drug of choice. Like, it is the worst for your brain. It's going to create inflammation. So that's, you know, what do you want to have not happen? Inflammation. But the other thing that it does is eating a high sugar impact diet causes insulin resistance. And that really causes problems in the brain because in the brain you need insulin to come up to trigger all the communication, all the, all the firing. And so without that, it's like your brain just got slow, old, inflamed, and angry, right? And the, the other part that sugar does is it triggers the reward center in your brain. So this is how we create this whole um, drug of choice situation is it triggers dopamine. And so you just keep coming back for more and more and more. In fact, they did this rat study where they gave the rats the choice between, first they gave them 
um, some kind of an opiate, I think it was morphine, and let them have as much as they wanted. And then they got a cho- then they had the um, they had Oreo cookies, and they got to have those. And then they got to choose between them, and they chose the Oreos for their reward. So triggers the reward center in the brain, and that's what they saw in that study, is that lit up, they both lit up the same reward center in the brain. But the other thing that it does, besides triggering that, so you want to keep going back for that dopamine hit, is that it will drive up serotonin and then deplete it. So then it creates this really bad situation where you just keep needing more and needing more and needing more. So you're needing more, you're creating inflammation in the brain, and then you're creating insulin resistance, so now you don't have the insulin you need up in the brain for the communication. So again, slowing you down, making you inflamed, and making you angry. Nothing you want your brain to be. You know, the big challenge we have with sugar is that we've really been looking at it all wrong. I mean, you just don't see that many people nowadays going out and getting a candy bar. We know better than that, but yet they'll get one of those energy bars and they're still loaded with sugar or they'll go drink one of those. The ones that kill me are where it's hiding or disguised as something healthy, like a lot of these smoothies or green drinks that are just a big sugar load. And and the big challenge there is that they're a fructose load. And the worst sugar of all for the brain and for the body overall is fructose. It's used a lot because it's sweeter than glucose is, but the challenge is it makes you more insulin resistant. It actually can make your gut more permeable so you're more sensitive to foods and you become food intolerant. It's more aging and it makes you fat. It goes straight to the liver and starts turning into fat. The other problem with our diet is we've been told for decades to eat a low fat diet which essentially is really bad for your brain because your brain is made up of mostly fat. In fact, 60% of it is omega-3 fats. It's rich in cholesterol. It's rich in saturated fat. And without adequate fat, you have trouble with your brain. We also know that all the chemicals in our food, additives, preservatives, also potentially have negative brain effects. And they've studied this in children where they give kids colored water with additives and colorings versus colored water from pomegranate. And the kids who have the colored water from the additives all get ADD and hyperactive. So we have really good evidence that these chemicals are having a negative effect on our brain. So our high sugar, high starch, low fat diet, along with all the processing in our diet is is extremely harmful. In fact, we now know that omega-6 fats, uh, refined omega-6 fats from processed oils, not naturally found in nuts and seeds and food, but processed oils have been linked to depression, to homicide, suicide, violence, and even poverty in very well done studies by the NIH. So I think we we underestimate the impact of food on our mood. If you look at what happened, for example, to long chain omega-3 fats, and these are really a great example of one of the most important things that I tell my patients to focus on eating. That's what I focus on. I look at my week, how do I judge it? Did I eat fatty fish that has long chain omega-3 fats? One of my sort of top criteria for eaters who are looking to support brain health. Omega-3 fats just got entirely stripped from our diet. We, we, we actually moved from having an omega-3 fat-based diet, a grass-based diet, to a diet that's based much more in um, seed oils and, and what are also essential fats, but you know, are thought to be much more inflammatory. Each mitochondria inside the cell, the, those tens of thousands of them, are made of tiny droplets of fat. So it's no wonder that if you eat the wrong fats, like vegetable oil, canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, hydrogenated fat, or anything deep fried, even if it's fried in good oil, what you get is you get the wrong fats built in Mm. to your mitochondria and into your cells, and then they constantly cause free radicals and inflammation. And it takes a while to rebuild the system. It took me about three years of Mm. super high fat, only undamaged fats, before I finally just lost the desire. Like, I I couldn't get enough grass-fed butter. It, It was like, it saved me. I'd been a raw vegan, I was deficient. But after three years, I backed off because I just didn't need as much as I did before. So if this is true, how do you reconcile the statements by the American Heart Association that we should reduce our saturated fat consumption less than 10%, even 5%, and how and eat more of these refined oils? That's their recommendations. And everybody hears that and they go, well, coconut oil is bad, saturated fat's bad. I almost laughed when they published that rehash of studies that the last of which was done in 1973. Every study on fat since 1973 was rejected by the American Heart Association so they could keep pushing the agenda of the American Canola Oil Manufacturers Association that funds the American Heart Association. Mm. Follow the money is what you're saying. It's a corrupt organization. And when real doctors and scientists looked at the data from the 1970s studies that the American Heart Association relies on, it turns out that the biggest of those studies, the one that ended in 1973, 
when you look at all the data, it actually found the opposite of what the American Heart Association says. So what we're dealing with here is pure marketing and propaganda from a company, a nonprofit company, that is backed with an agenda, and the agenda appears to be keep people sick. If you're enjoying this series, please consider sharing it with your friends and loved ones by clicking the share button below. Many of these factors, like too many antibiotics, stress, eating a lot of sugar and processed food, could lead to an overgrowth of bad bugs in your gut, like yeast, which can cause serious damage not only to your gut, but also to your brain. There's a huge connection between the gut and the brain, and when the gut is not out of balance, when the bacteria, yeast, and or parasites uh, get out of balance, those things can trigger systemic inflammation. That systemic inflammation, in turn, can trigger withdrawal behavior. Uh, it can increase uh, molecules in the body called cytokines. And it's sort of like when you get this, the flu and it's really, you're really sick with the flu and you want to sort of just withdraw. That's what you do, and that's what depression is. We now know that two-thirds of our immune system is embedded in our gastrointestinal tract. And when you have an inflamed, irritated GI tract, that lymphatic system, that immune system, is inflamed also, sending all kinds of cytokine messages, inflammatory message, to the entire rest of your body, including to your brain. And guess what your brain has? Your brain has an immune system, the microglia, the astroglia, and those cells respond to cytokines. And guess what they do? When they are, get a message from the gut, hey, we're under attack, we have uh, a lot of uh, invasion going on of something, we don't know what, but we have a lot of invasion going on in the immune system that's embedded in the gut. Then the brain immune system also uh, gets overactive, starts producing cytokines. And inflammatory cytokines in the brain can interfere with mood, with cognition, with everything that's going on in the brain. Food allergies are one of the biggest causes of a compromised gut microbiome. So what are food allergies anyway? There are two main types of food allergies, acute and delayed. Everybody knows about the acute form because it happens immediately and in a big way. If you eat a peanut and your throat closes, you get hives and you can't breathe, you'll never eat a peanut again. You know you're allergic to them. But delayed allergies or sensitivities are sneaky. You may eat a piece of bread on Monday and be depressed on Wednesday, or have a piece of cheese today and get a migraine tomorrow. You'll never make the connection because you don't even realize food can have this kind of impact on you. This type of allergy or sensitivity is ignored by most conventional doctors. And yet addressing this in my practice is one of the most powerful things I do to help people recover from nearly almost any problem. Allergic diseases of both types, acute and delayed, are on the rise for many reasons. We are becoming hypersensitive to our environments, perhaps because we live in an over-sterilized environment and our immune systems don't mature properly, or because we're eating hybridized and genetically modified foods full of hormones, antibiotics, and pesticides, and additives unknown to our immune systems just a generation or two ago. The result? our immune system becomes unable to recognize friend from foe. To distinguish between foreign molecular invaders we truly need to protect against, or the foods we eat, or in some cases our own cells. Delayed allergies or sensitivities occur because many of our 21st century habits lead to a breakdown of the normal barrier that protects our immune system from the outside world of foods and bugs and toxins. That barrier is our gut. 60% of your immune system is right under that barrier. And when the lining of your gut breaks down, your immune system is activated by food particles that it misinterprets as foreign invaders, and this sets off a chain reaction leading to inflammation throughout your body, including your brain. The most common food allergies or sensitivities that I see in my practice are dairy, corn, soy, and the biggest beast of them all, gluten. Don't eat gluten. Gluten is bad for everybody. Now this comes not from me, not my voice. This comes from way up there at the top of the totem pole. Um, Alessio Fasano is a professor at Harvard, right? And when he came to, from Italy to be a professor at University of Maryland uh, Medical School, 
with $2 million of funding because he's a brilliant guy. And he learned from the gastroenterologist that this thing about gluten is very uh, funny. A lot of people think gluten's bad for you, but the gastroenterologist really don't, we don't buy this. Except for people with, you know, the particular disease that has to go to with not having gluten not agree with you. And you have to do a biopsy for that and special tests. And then, okay, now you're, you shouldn't eat gluten. But for the rest of us, it's not a problem. So he looked into it with his scholarly eyes. And it turns out that gluten's bad for everybody. It opens up what we call the tight junctions, which is like the mortar between the flagstones on your sidewalk. If they get, the, the mortar gets loose, then the rain can go right through. If it's the, this, uh, the sidewalk of your digestive tract, then things that are supposed to stay in your intestine get through your blood, into your blood, without, being, without going through customs, so to speak. And that's, you don't want to have poopy stuff going straight into your blood, or even undigested tomato juice. And if, you, if it does, then it, it, it's bad. And these same junctions are what keeps the dirtiness of the blood, because the bird blood is still not that clean. It's, it gets pretty, it's pretty good, but it's transporting a lot of molecules that came from your, from your food that you know, got through customs, but they're still not what you'd want to have in your brain. So the same type junctions stay closed when the blood circulates through your brain so that you don't get stuff in your brain. So the, that's called the blood-brain barrier. And then the one for your bowel is the bowel-blood barrier. They don't, they don't use that expression much, but those are the same, same thing. So if gluten opens the tight junctions in the gut, it's going to open up the tight junctions in the brain to some extent. Say I'm, I'm giving a lecture, and Dr. Fasano is, is lecturing, and I'm the moderator. And Dr. Fasano is lecturing, and I'm looking at the audience, and he says to these doctors, my, all my colleagues, he says, and the tight junctions are opened by gluten in everybody. And the audience is, has some pretty stunned faces in it. They go, oh, not me, no, not me. So then when the time for questioning comes up at the end, they're passing in the slips of paper with questions on it, and I, I'm waiting for that. So I'm the moderator, so I get to ask the first question. I say, Alicia, uh, you said, Tight junctions are open in everybody by gluten, and everybody in the audience was kind of shocked. Could you explain and elaborate on that? He says, yes, they're open by everybody. I said, what's the difference between the person who has some awful thing happening from gluten and the person who seems to be fine eating a loaf of bread every day? He said, well, it's just how long the tight junctions stay open. He's not saying nobody should ever eat gluten because he's a professor at Harvard, and they can't say things like that because their funding would go away. But the idea from, from the practitioner's side, why people should need. So that takes gluten and sugar and maybe soy. So those are things that I would expect people to, to latch on to. Many people who come to me, have already, they've already gotten there. We all cut our teeth in studying the pros and cons of wheat by learning about celiac disease. That's where we cut our teeth. And so unfortunately, so many doctors think if you don't have a problem with celiac, mm. you, don't, you do not have a problem with wheat. Mm. But that's not true. Celiac is one manifestation of a problem with wheat, a sensitivity. And we know about 1% of the population has celiac disease in the US and in Europe, about 1%. We know in clinical practice, the studies say, 30% of people that come into us in my practice, I look more deeply and I can find as many as 60% of the people that come in have an immune reaction saying, you've got a sensitivity to wheat, mm -hmm. but they, they, they don't have celiac disease, mm -hmm. but they have a sensitivity to wheat. And that concept bore out the term non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which has become known much more in the last eight to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So celiac is really important as an autoimmune disease. An autoimmune disease means your immune system is attacking your own tissue. And for some reason, when you eat wheat, if you have this genetic vulnerability, you attack the tissue of your gut. And we know a lot of the mechanisms of what causes that. That's the autoimmune component of it. But there are many other manifestations of a sensitivity to wheat outside of celiac disease. It can be fatigue. It can be brain fog. It can be numbness and tingling called peripheral neuropathies. It can be hormone imbalances. It can be recurrent miscarriages. It, the list goes on and on and on. Not just celiac, mm -hmm. but wheat sensitivity. Yeah. So it's fascinating. When, you, when you're talking about it, as a doctor, I learned that 
you had it or you didn't. Right. You had celiac disease that was demonstrated by an abnormal biopsy, and if that was negative, it was fine to eat wheat. But we know that you know while celiac can cause literally dozens of different diseases, everything from osteoporosis to colitis to schizophrenia to autism to depression and on and on, most doctors just dismiss any reaction that's not full-blown celiac. If the gut is weakened by a nutrient-poor diet, high in sugar and low in fiber, by nutritional deficiencies of zinc and omega-3 fats, by the overuse of antibiotics and hormones, by exposure to environmental toxins, and by unprecedented levels of mental and emotional stressors, then the outside environment leaks into your body and your brain, and you develop allergies and systemic immune issues. This is called a leaky gut. In fact, much of what we see go wrong in this epidemic of mood and brain disorders is because of a leaky brain. If you think allergies to food don't affect your brain like your body, you are sadly mistaken. Every part of your body and every cell in your body communicates with every other part of your body and every other cell. Everybody's talking at the same time and making sense of all that conversation is called health. Good communication is good health. And there is a lot of talking going on between your brain, your immune system, your gut, and your hormonal system. We call this PNEI, or psycho neuro immune endocrinology. In fact, the gut is called the second brain because it has its own nervous system and many transmitters like the brain. It is through this system that your gut and immune systems talk to each other and talk to your brain. And it governs how food triggers a cascade of events throughout the body and the brain. The immune system and the brain have much in common. They're responsible for perceiving or quote, seeing our world and for remembering those perceptions. They sense things and remember things. The nervous system sees the big world through our five senses and remembers things in the memory cells, also known as the neurons of the brain. The immune system sees the microscopic world of little particles from food and microbes and pollens and dust and remembers their unique identity in the immune cells. So you see, they have a very similar job. Problems arise when the immune system or the nervous system overreacts to normally innocuous substances like food proteins or microbes that normally live in harmony with us. Three basic abnormal reactions to foods can trigger brain injury. First, they can cause inflammation, which in turn inflames the brain. Second, small partially digested food proteins called peptides from gluten and casein can act to disturb the normal neurotransmitter function in the brain. And third, they can act as excitotoxins, increasing glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter, and creating a chain reaction that overexcites, injures, inflames, and ultimately kills brain cells. Inflammation is the body's attempt to warn the rest of the system. So if almost any bad thing is happening, the cells at the site of the irritation will send out alarm chemicals. And these are alarm messenger molecules. And these alarm molecules are generally inflammatory. So it turns out that if you happen to have a ragweed allergy and you inhale ragweed pollen, um, that will, through a series of biochemical steps, cause your mast cells to release histamine. And histamine causes all the symptoms that we know of as allergy, but it also is telling the rest of the immune system that there's something happening that it should be paying attention to. So fundamentally, inflammation is simply the body's attempt to communicate with the rest of the immune system and the rest of the body that there's something going on that should be paid attention to. So a depressed individual will have inflammation of their brain. And inflammation, just like if you, you hit your thumb with a hammer, the moment the hammer bounces off of your thumb, the injury is over. But your thumb swells for the next week probably, and it takes another two weeks before your thumb is normal again. And the same thing happens with your brain. Your brain is inflamed. Your thumb isn't going to work particularly well when it's inflamed. Neither is your brain. 
And so when you have an inflamed brain, something is not going to work right. You may, you know, if you have the flu and you have an inflamed brain, you just feel foggy and you feel awful, but you also feel depressed. And, you know, people with acute viral illnesses, they'll say things, I feel so awful, I just want to die. Well, that sounds a little bit like somebody in a deep depression, doesn't it? And it's the same kind of process. So how do you reduce inflammation? Uh, well, the first thing you want to do is take away the thing that's causing inflammation. So if we go back to our ragweed allergy, you want to try to avoid ragweed, right? You, you want to get away from the thing that is causing inflammation. Next, there are many um, nutritional things that reduce inflammation. So eating a diet that has lots of color, and I don't mean Skittles, I mean lots of natural color. So, you know, the great thing about fast food or, you know, candy is that every single bite has a full day supply of food coloring because we don't need any. But deep, colorful vegetables are anti-inflammatory. And you know, you'd think something like peppers that are just hot as can be would be inflammatory, but actually peppers are anti-inflammatory. So the flavors are not what we're talking about. It's actually the biochemical reactions of these foods. So the best medicine always starts with food. So a variety of foods. And I tell people, you know, you've heard about get your five a day, which stands for three vegetables and two fruits. But that comes from get your three to five vegetables and two to three fruits. Nobody talks about get your eight a day, but if you're unwell, you should be getting your eight to 10 a day. And then, you know, a variety. People eat, you know, peas, carrots, corn, and then the next day maybe they have peas, carrots, and corn. And after that, they probably have peas, carrots, and corn. But if you really think about, there are 21 meals in a week, right? Three times seven. If you thought about 21 different fruits and vegetables every week, that's variety, and that's going to give you lots of different nutrients. The bottom line is that an unhappy, chaotic, disorganized, disengaged, forgetful brain is an inflamed brain. The trail of scientific clues leads us to a few final common pathways for all illness, and inflammation is a key pathway. What inflames the brain is what inflames the gut. Doctors of the future will become experts not only in identifying inflammation, which we are already becoming increasingly good at, but in navigating the ultimate causes of that inflammation and putting out the fire instead of just dealing with the smoke. My personal road to a broken brain was rooted in heavy metal toxicity from mercury. All of my exposure to this heavy metal, combined with genes that prevent me from effectively detoxifying the metals in my body, led to a slow and significant poisoning of my cells and my mitochondria. And the effects were obvious. I felt weak, tired, I couldn't think. I had muscle pain and twitches. I had insomnia, digestive problems, food allergies. I had depression and anxiety. It was only by discovering high levels of mercury in my hair and urine and slowly detoxifying myself that I was able to get better. And I've seen this over and over in my patients too. From chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, to depression, anxiety, to obesity, dementia, Parkinson's disease, cancer, heart failure, and heart disease, the message is clear. We are being poisoned by heavy metals. We are exposed to astounding amounts of brain pollution. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, about 2.5 billion pounds of toxic chemicals are released yearly by large industrial facilities. Even common medications contains heavy metals. For example, aluminum, which has been linked to higher risk of Alzheimer's, is found in antacids such as Gaviscon, Maalox, and Mylanta, that people swig like orange juice for heartburn. It is also found in our water, in our cookware, in foil wrap, and many underarm deodorants. Until recently, mercury in the form of thimerosal was the most common disinfectant placed in vaccines and contact lens fluid. Let's talk about metals for a minute, because I think that, that, you know, in medicine, we sort of ignored it. Like, unless you have an acute toxicity, in other, in other words, you're poisoned by lead, or you have, you have heavy metals that you're exposed to in an occupational way, or, you know, you're, you're in an occupational environment that has other metals, then, okay, we, we, we acknowledge it, uh, although we don't have a great way of treating it, <laughs> except avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, 
But in, in functional medicine, we, we understand that there's a low level impact of these things that can happen over decades for smaller levels. Heavy metals, not just mercury, but lead, cadmium, and arsenic, which is really not a heavy element, but it is a toxic uh, element, at low levels produce chronic symptomatologies and have neurotoxic effects that are very complex that are often missed, as you're pointing out. Mm. And that, we don't even know how to test for it. That, that's exactly right. And, and so what we're starting to see, and in fact, I met a woman by the name of Vera Steckshall. She was an astro, she's an immunologist, and, and she actually was uh, able to save one of their important drugs uh, uh, from being uh, not approved because she found a, a way of studying its, uh, its toxicity and showing that it was actually not toxic to the immune system as some people thought it wasn't going to yeah. be approved. So the uh, leadership of the company was so pleased to, to have her make that discovery that they said, Dr. Steckshell, you can study whatever you want. We're going to give you your own laboratory in Stockholm uh, at Karolinska and you can uh, do whatever you want. She said, I want to study heavy metal low level toxicity. And they said, go, well, go for it. We're giving you millions of dollars and you can do whatever you want. So she developed methods uh, using uh, whole white cell assays to evaluate in, in different individuals low level toxicity to cadmium, mercury, lead, arsenic. And it was unbelievable what she found. She found that the level that, that was producing adverse effects on the immune system of some of these individuals, and she also looked at nickel, palladium, and platinum. Some of these things that are found in, in dental um, materials are found even in, uh, in replacement joints that were considered inert, were not an, inert at all. That in some individuals, at part per trillion levels, they were producing immunological adverse effects in these individuals. She published a whole series of papers on this over the course of 10 years, and she developed, uh, developed actually a laboratory method uh, for assessment using white cell analysis for looking at heavy metal toxicity. That's revolutionized the concept of chronic toxicity, immunotoxicity from heavy metals. Mm. Well below, uh, I mean, a million or, or, or more levels lower than had ever been previously recognized to have ad adverse effects. And she showed that this effect could vary from person to person by orders of magnitude. One mm. person might have no adverse mm. effect, another person at a much lower level had a significant effect. So this is a whole new frontier as to where functional medicine would see itself versus pathological toxicology. Yeah, I think this is a very great point. I just want to bring it clinically for a minute because the idea that, that your immune system is driving brain dysfunction was really never a medical concept. We're seeing the, the neuroinflammation being a central concept now as so many diseases across the spectrum from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's to autism, they have tremendous amounts of inflammation in their brain to depression, which mm -hmm. we thought was more of a psychological issue, maybe driven by inflammatory factors from your gut, from infections, from toxins. So it was revolutionizing a way of thinking about it, but it hasn't really revolutionized our practice of medicine. And in functional medicine, I've treated all those conditions with extraordinary success by using this concept of neuroinflammation and neurotoxicology from from this sort of emerging research. And it's it's pretty compelling. You know, I think we don't really understand that. And the genetics are, are, are really critical too. I mean, we, we know that they did a study looking at the cohort of patients who were given fillings, kids, and not in plastic fillings versus mercury fillings. And they followed these kids for a long period of time. This is an NIH study. And when you, when you actually tested the genetics of these kids, the ones who had good detoxification genetics weren't really impacted by the mercury. The kids who had poor detox genetics, they had a seven-year developmental delay in their, in their brain function compared to the kids who didn't have the mercury fillings. Environmental toxins place a huge burden on our guts and our brains. We live in an environment steeped in chemicals that our bodies were not designed to process. As I started noticing more of my patients suffering from disease because of toxins, I then started looking at, well, what percent of chronic disease is due to toxins? So I hired a couple of really bright graduates of mine, and we spent a year looking at the research, and I would now assert that the primary driver of chronic disease in the industrialized world is now environmental toxins. Now, I want to be real clear, I'm not saying that nutritional deficiencies are no longer a problem. I'm not saying nutritional excesses are no longer a problem. What I'm saying is that we've actually added an even bigger problem, and we're poisoning ourselves with metals and chemicals. So if you look at what happens to the brain when it's exposed to things like arsenic or cadmium or 
bisphenol A or things of this nature, what it does is it causes the neurons to become damaged. As neurons become damaged, they're not, they're not able to work as well. Now, at the early stages, people don't really recognize that because we have a lot of extra functioning in our brains. But as you start causing more and more damage, the first thing people will notice is, well, they don't remember that person's name quite as quickly. Or they'll start saying, they're talking and they had a word they know they want to use, but they, they have trouble finding the word. So they may start noticing that things seem kind of fuzzy sometimes, and maybe their sensa sensations in the world seems like maybe they're a little distant from the world. So what's happening is kind of the early stages of the brain not being able to function as effectively as it should. It's not dementia, it's not old age, but it's no longer quite as good as it was. One of my big surprises in looking at the research was how common environmental toxicity is. So for example, most people don't realize that 10% of the water supplies in the US, these are the public water supplies, the ones where you expect the government would be paying attention to them, 10% of them have levels of arsenic known to induce disease in humans. Then you look at things like health and beauty aids. It's like, uh, you know, did, you, did you put lotion on this morning? Did you put sunscreen on to protect yourself from the sun? Well, those things have what are called phthalates, and the phthalates are actually pretty toxic to the body. They do things like bind to insulin receptor sites so that you can't get sugars into the cells and eventually they cause you have, to have diabetes. And they also cause trouble in the brain because they impair the function of the neurons as well. So there, there are so many toxins I can talk about. Um, mercury, for example. If a person has so-called silver fillings, what they don't realize is that, that those silver fillings are actually 55% mercury. It leaks into the body and it leaks into the brain. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control of the U.S. government, has put as their top five uh, arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, uh, vinyl chloride, things of this nature. When I was looking at the research, I was looking at which toxins have the strongest disease correlations or causations, and I also agreed uh, arsenic is number one. But then I looked at DDT. You might say, wait, DDT was banned 47 years ago. But DDT is something called a persistent organic pollutant, which means that it's very difficult to break down the, in the environment. And once it gets into our body, it's very difficult to break down in our body. The half-life and amount of time it takes for our body to get rid of one half of the DDT that we're being exposed to is bet between two and 10 years. So what happens is DDT builds up in the body, and DDT is a neurotoxin. It causes oxidative stress in the, in the, in the neurons, and the neurons degenerate more, qu more quickly. So I would say uh, mercury, arsenic, DDT, organophosphate pesticides, they are very, very neurotoxic. So there's um, questions you can ask yourself to determine if you're likely to have toxins, and there are some ways you can measure the amount of damage being done to your body by toxins. Let's do the latter one first. So there's a standard laboratory test called GGTP. It's a liver enzyme. Now normally it's only measured when we're looking for people with hepatitis. Because what happens when cells get, hep when the liver gets inflammation from hepatitis, uh, whether it's a virus or uh, what else may be going on, the cells start leaking enzymes, they show up in the blood, and now you know a person has hepatitis. But it turns out that the body increases its production of, of GTT in the liver in response to oxidative stress and to environmental toxins. The reason it does that is that GTT recycles glutathione in the body. It turns out glutathione <clears throat> is one of the most important molecules to protect us from oxidative stress and also get toxins out of the body. So our really smart bodies, when we're exposed to toxins, they increase GTT. The normal range for GTT is between 10 and 60. Anybody with a GTT above 20 actually has toxic load. So within the normal range, GTT goes up in proportion to toxic load. So for example, look at things like diabetes. Some with the GTT between 30 and 50, well within the normal range, has an eight times higher risk of diabetes because they have so many toxins going on. There's another molecule that can be measured, and that's in the urine, so GTT is measured in the blood. A molecule called 8-OHDG can be measured in the urine. 8 ohdg is a measure of the amount of DNA damage that's going on in a person's body. The more toxins they're being exposed to, the more 8 ohdg that shows up in the urine. So then if you want to look at, well, who is most likely toxic? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If you are eating conventionally grown foods, and particularly eating foods that have been prepared and stored in plastic, you're getting tons of toxins into your body. You're getting the, or the unfortunately, you get the pesticides, like organochlorine pesticides, organophosphate pesticides from the foods that are being grown. If you store them in plastic, now you're getting bisphenol A from the plastic. 
If you're eating soybeans that have been grown conventionally, you're getting cadmium. Uh, unfortunately, one of the best predictors of how toxic a person is, is are they eating conventionally grown foods or are they eating organically grown foods that are stored in safe, safe uh, packaging? Another way to determine how toxic a person is, is do you use health and beauty aids? If you use standard health and beauty aids, they've got a lot of phthalates, and there's even lead still in some types of, of lipstick. So it's a pretty significant source of toxins is using standard health and beauty aids. Another area to consider is, are you living in an area with high levels of arsenic? So you have to, you have to kind of look at how a person living. Are they being consciously aware of toxins in their environment? Are they working to avoid those toxins? Because if you're not working to avoid the toxins, you've got toxins. So BPA, uh, we now know there's huge disease associations with BPA. So now people say, well, we'll use BPS and BPF instead. Well, if you look in the cells and look at animal studies, they're just as toxic as BPA, but because they're more recently being used, the human data for damage has not shown up yet. But I'll guarantee you, five, 10 years from now, we'll find they're just as toxic as the bis bisphenol A. So let me be clear. I'm very, very aware of the huge problem with toxins, but I don't want to go live in a cave somewhere. You know, I, I enjoy modern civilization. I like my computer. I like my motorcycle. What I want to say is we need to put pressure on the manufacturers to produce these products in a way that they're not poisoning us. That's all possible, and we can make choices. So we make choices by only buying prepared foods that are in class, for example. Okay? Only buy foods that's organic grown. Only buy health and beauty aids that have low toxins. So manufacturers, they don't want it's not their intent to poison us. Their intent is to make a profit. Well, if you stop buying the products and start buying the products of the safe manufacturers, they'll get the message, we'll have safer products. We're also living in a country that's overprescribed medication. 81% of Americans take at least one medication per week. Are you one of those people popping antacid blockers for indigestion or a cholesterol-lowering medication or acetaminophen for your joint pain or a birth control pill or getting the flu vaccine every year? We know that drugs have many, many effects, and many of these effects damage your brain if they're not addressed. I have some big concerns regarding some of the most common medications. What concerns me as much as what we do know now is what we don't know. The past decade has seen a litany of fallen heroes, Biox, Avandia, Rizulin, Seldane, Baycol, CETP inhibitors, Premarin, and more. Which of the drugs that millions consume today will be the fallen heroes of tomorrow. I do think that we are overprescribing antidepressants for mental health issues. I see over and over again patients coming to me who have been prescribed antidepressants, often for a variety of off-label uses that aren't mood disorders, where all sorts of specialists are using them, frankly, in ways that they haven't been researched at all. In addition, I often see really well-meaning primary care doctors and psychiatrists who aren't sure what else to do or aren't sure how to help somebody, and so they just start an antidepressant. And that's problematic because we know that in many cases, exercise actually goes head to head in the literature with antidepressants and is just as effective. We know that some of these antidepressants aren't much more effective than placebo. We knew that some of these antidepressants actually have really concerning side effects and can lead to higher rates of suicidality. Now there are certainly cases where antidepressants and medications of the like are absolutely appropriate and can be really helpful, but they shouldn't be first line treatment. They should not be our go-to, and they are. And so we have millions of people who are prescribed antidepressants, and now more and more I see stimulants for conditions that aren't pathologies, aren't a disease, aren't even a mental health imbalance, but are just the result of their lifestyle. And it's the result of not sleeping, having too much caffeine, eating too much sugar, being inflamed, having poor digestion. We know that there's a big brain-gut connection. Uh, having even infections going on that haven't been detected. And so why aren't we looking for these things before we prescribe a drug that then ends up being a lifelong drug because people are then afraid to get off of a drug that they didn't even need in the first place? We're actually really effective at Parsley Health in some cases in helping people safely get off of these medications that they didn't need. And we use genetic testing often to help us do that because there's genomics that teach us which drug is more appropriate for a certain person, whether or not that person would have responded just as well to exercise. And we can use this information that's truly cutting edge to help people get off of unnecessary medications. I also think that we need to sound an alarm about the number of stimulants that are being prescribed. These stimulants are speed, effectively, and they are drugs of abuse, and they are addictive. 
And what I'm seeing is that patients are able to get off of some of the antidepressants. They are not able to get off of some of the stimulants. And so selling someone who's just tired and having trouble focusing because they're looking at their, their mobile phones too much and they're not sleeping well and they're eating poorly, that they need a stimulant that they're then going to be addicted to, to for life uh, is really problematic. And I think, you know, we've sounded the alarm amongst physicians for the opioid epidemic that physicians in part created. And we're really addressing that as a field today. And I think that's incredibly uh, powerful. I think we need to sound the same alarm for stimulant medications that are being overprescribed. I am certainly not against medication. Sometimes they are absolutely necessary, but they should be used carefully with full awareness of all their effects. I wrote Ultramind Solution almost 10 years ago, and it was a result of nothing I read in a journal, but the extraordinary results I was seeing by accident uh, by treating people's gut their brain would get better. That's right. And I was like, what's going on here? That shouldn't and, happen. No. I, and, uh, and it does happen. It and does. We work on the gut and the brain gets better and the skin gets better and the joint pain goes away. Mm -hmm. These are all issues that are based upon inflammation. Yeah. And guess what? Alzheimer's is a prototypic inflammatory disorder. Same sort of inflammation, same markers, same mediators as they're involved in heart disease, as yeah. diabetes, as even cancer. There's almost like a few common pathways. That's right. And depending on the person, it can hit different organs, whether it's autoimmune disease or dementia or heart disease or diabetes or cancer. I mean, at Cleveland Clinic, there are scientists now discovering that the microbiome plays a role in the development of cancer. Oh, that's right. And, and you know, we call these the broad strokes. And, you know, there is this real push for us to be super specialized these days and to develop uh, protocols that are so specifically targeted for the individual, we call this personalized medicine. I think that's great. But at the same time, we know that taking a step back and looking at the broad strokes about what really are the general dietary uh, recommendations, what are people doing wrong in terms of their medications, over the counter as well as prescription, that are affecting the microbiome, the gut bacteria, and are then amplifying the gut permeability, enhancing inflammation, and ultimately, in my area of interest, leading to death of brain cells. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you're basically talking about a revolution in our thinking because the gut microbiome we didn't even talk about a few years ago. And we didn't, we didn't understand how it was connected to all these diseases, including brain disorders, not just Alzheimer's, but depression, autism, ADD, uh, Parkinson's. I mean, these, these conditions are, are, we thought were in the brain, but you're talking about the microbiome as this new organ that we have to actually investigate, learn about, treat. And so, so tell us more about this sort of discovery you made about how this all works in your book, Brain Maker, that led you to sort of kind of revolutionize your thinking? Well, again, it was because of, I think, lack of tools in the toolbox. Neurologists are, you know, working under the premise of diagnose and adios, and meaning that, boy, we'll come up with a great name for a disease, and that sounds great, aren't we smart? But then there's <laughs> nothing to do. To do. There's, we're, we're left empty-handed, and I, was, I wasn't gonna spend the rest of my career uh, doing that and le having people walk out of the office without something to do. So I endeavored to discover uh, what were these relationships. I mean, if, if we granted inflammation is a, a underlying mechanism of Parkinson's, MS, um, yeah. autism, Alzheimer's, they are inflammatory disorders, okay, then where is this inflammation coming from? Not a bad question to ask. Yeah. And it turns out that when you look at the it's literature... It's sort of self-evident, right? Really, but it's not it's something we do in medicine. from the gut. Okay, that means this neurologist is gonna start paying attention to gastroenterology. Oh no, you can't go there. That's the turf of the gastroenterologist. Yeah. And I went to my gastroenterologist friends and began discussing this. There was no interest. Yeah. And it became very evident to me one day when I worked on a patient with migraine headaches by changing her diet and putting her on, get this, a gluten-free diet, uh, and her migraine headaches went away. This is something she had for 25 years, was taking narcotics yeah. for her pain. She went back to the gastroenterologist who said, I've scoped you, you don't have celiac disease, why on earth would you go gluten-free? Go back on gluten, you need it. <laughs> and uh, she refused. Had she done so, we know she would, her headaches would have recurred. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, there is such pushback 
on anything nutritional. As you well know, recently there was uh, an, an innuendo uh, based upon a study that came out saying that if you go gluten-free, you're gonna be at higher risk for heart disease. And that is not the conclusion that the authors actually reached. Harvard researchers, the, the conclusion was if you go gluten-free, which means likely cut back on dietary fiber, that's not a good thing. I am totally in for that. I agree well, Most people with don't you. eat gluten and dietary fiber. It's white flour. Right. <laughs> uh, but the point is that the fundamentals are that the brain is not um, able to deal with inflammation very well, that inflammation happens when we disrupt the gut bacteria by uh, a, a diet that's inappropriate, by taking medications that are disfavorable. What are the medications that screw up your gut microbiome? Well, I mean, the obvious ones are antibiotics. When you disrupt the gut bacteria by taking um, antibiotics, understand that is a lifelong change in your microbiome that is never the same again. Uh, antibiotic exposure is strongly related to uh, diabetes risk as much as a 50% increased risk from one course of antibiotic. A very large Danish study demonstrated that. The non-steroid anti-inflammatory medications are notorious for disrupting the gut bacteria and that likely explains why C. diff or Clostridium difficile is higher in people who generally take these uh, non-steroid yeah. anti-inflammatories. I think the biggest issue is going to turn out to be oddly enough these acid-blocking drugs called proton pump inhibitors. Which you can buy over the counter. Which are generally bought over the counter. Uh, one study out of Stanford indicated about a 16% 16% increased risk of heart attack in people taking these PPIs. And if you have that heart attack, your risk of dying from it is increased, is doubled, basically. And uh, that happens because of changes in the pH of the gut. Why would you be surprised that these drugs would change the acidity of the gut? Because that's what they're designed to, to do. do. Right. When you change the acid, acid level, acid-based balance of the gut, it changes the environment in which the bacteria live. Certain species will thrive, certain species will be suppressed. And you have this loss of diversity of gut bacteria that leads to leakiness of the gut and the brain, and it sets the stage for disaster. One of the most common overlooked reasons for a damaged gut is stress. Have you ever wondered why most animals in the wild don't get ulcers? They don't live in a state of chronic stress. We humans do. We stew in our own stress juices, like cortisol, which kills brain cells, shrinks the brain, and leads to dementia. It also causes crippling depression and other mood disorders. Cortisols are one of our main stress hormones and it's produced by the adrenals, which are two little glands that sit on top of your kidneys in the body. And when you make cortisol in response to a stress, that's your body working. We developed a fight or flight response so that we could run away from a lion or uh, survive, right? But today in our, in our worlds that we're living in now, I, what I see is patients living in emergency all day long. They're in feeling like they're in emergency from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. They're running, running, running from work to maybe exercise to taking care of family. Uh, they're eating too much sugar, they're living on caffeine, so both of those things are stimulants. They're constantly hyper-stimulated. And as a result, their body stays in fight or flight mode and never gets to go into the opposite of fight or flight mode, which is rest, digest, relax, and heal. And that side of your nervous system needs to take over so that your body can rest, digest, relax, and heal. And so what I see is that a lot of people are never actually getting to heal. They're living in a state where their fight or flight hormones like cortisol are always elevated or are constantly spiking. High cortisol leads to blood sugar spikes, which leads to insulin spikes. That leads to insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and ultimately diabetes. That can also imbalance some of your sex hormones, testosterone and the like. So we see hormone imbalances as a result of those chronic high cortisol um, states. We see imbalances in sleep. When you don't sleep, your brain doesn't get to take out the metabolic trash uh, that it creates during the day through regular metabolism. So it's literally like your brain doesn't get to clean up its house overnight, which is what one of the reasons sleep is so important. And so what we see is then people are chronically sleep deprived, exhausted, they're gaining weight, their blood sugar is imbalanced, and that is the beginning of disease, of dysfunction, and many of the huge chronic diseases that we see that are crippling our healthcare system. Stress also has a negative impact on the brain. We know that physical stresses will cause emotional stress. We know that emotional stress will have physical effects. So uh, we know, for example, that if you're having an infection or if you have heavy metals or if your gut's not working or if you have infections with Lyme disease, this all affects 
your brain and can lead to all these broken brain issues. But we also know that stress itself, psychological stress, can have a, a serious impact on the body, but also on the brain. We know that when you have high levels of sustained cortisol, which is the stress hormone, that that shrinks the memory center in your brain. That you literally have an increased risk of dementia and cognitive issues as you are more stressed. We know the opposite is true, that when you meditate or do yoga, these practices actually re reform connections in the brain. We call that neuroplasticity. They help recreate new brain cells. We call that neurogenesis. We know that they increase stem cells. They decrease inflammation. So learning how to regulate stress is really important. All of us are exposed to stress, and sadly, most of us have far more stress than we ever did a thousand years ago with the advent of, of TV and, and internet and all of our devices and on our constant workload. All these things are pretty, pretty abnormal. In fact, the average hunter-gatherer tribe spent about 20 hours a week actually working, trying to get food. The rest of the time, they just hung out and chilled. You know? we, we don't do that. We just go all day long and all night long sometimes. And this creates really serious consequences for our health and our brain. To treat depression and autism and Alzheimer's or any disease that affects mood, behavior, or the brain, we must learn how to get rid of the causes of inflammation, such as leaky gut, and also to restore the normal immune balances through the food we eat, through nutrients, exercise, sleep, and stress management. You can impact your brain through your diet and heal your body. In fact, your body and your mind are not two separate systems. They're one elegant, continuous ecosystem. What you do to the body affects the brain and what you do to the brain affects the body. In episodes seven and eight, our experts will provide you with practical steps that you can take today to start healing your gut and your brain. In our next episode, we will dive deep into devastating brain disorders that rob many of our elderly, and even a few young people of a healthy and joyful life. Stay tuned for discussion around Alzheimer's and dementia, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. And before you leave this episode, please consider entering a comment below to tell us what you think about the information we covered today. We'd love to hear from you. If the Broken Brain docuseries is a resource that you would like to own, then consider supporting our mission by making this series yours. You'll be able to share it with loved ones and watch it whenever you wish. Thanks to your support, we're able to spread the message that you can heal from a broken brain. This will allow you to go deeper and to get some more of those breakthrough moments that I hope you've had in watching this docuseries. Though I sure tried, we simply could not fit all the information that was shared during these interviews in this series. When you own the Broken Brain docuseries, you'll have access to over 30 hours of education about the brain. Please know that you're fully covered with our No Questions Asked 90-Day Money Back Guarantee. That way you can decide whether or not the content in this series resonates with you, but I'm 100% certain that it will. Again, thank you for your support. And to learn more about owning this docuseries, click the link below.